Yesterday, my brothers and sisters, as you, as you already know, we began by saying that Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam was best known, or we can understand Aba Abdullah al Hussein in the best way possible by looking at what he said. And we said that this is the best way to understand another human being, whoever they may be, a person in front of you, a person that came in history, through the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, where he says, تَكَلَّمُوا تَعْرَفُوا فَإِنَّ الْمَرْأَ مَخْبُوءٌ تَحْتَ لِسَانِهِ Speak and you'll be known, for surely the individual is known, or surely the individual is hidden underneath his or her tongue. So with that premise, we went to analyze Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam through his words. And we went to bask in his glory, alayhi salamullah, by the words that came out of his mouth, by his speech. So we began, my brothers and sisters, by analyzing one of the sermons of Aba Abdullah al Hussein that he gave before Karbala, and that was the sermon in Mina. And in that sermon, Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam spoke about Al Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an al Munkar, enjoining good and forbidding evil. And we said, that Aba Abdullah al Hussein was doing this, calling the people towards what Islam itself is calling us for, rather the main goal of Islam, rather what makes up Islam as a religion, where the hadith say that Al Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an al Munkar, enjoining good and forbidding evil, is what makes Islam Islam. And then we said we want to analyze some of the words of Aba Abdullah al Hussein on the plains of Karbala to understand his state, his state of mind, and his method of thinking when he was on those planes on that sacred day. And so that is the, sort of, that is what we're going to analyze today, my brothers and sisters. But before I begin, I want to say something. I want to make something sort of clear to everyone here. And as you said, or as I said before, sorry, you are all my family. I grew up with you. I know most of you. If I don't know you personally, then at the very least we share a home and that is this Mu'assasa. I want to say this before I begin. I want to say that if I'm up here speaking passionately, it's not aggression. I'm not speaking aggressively to you. It's because I feel personally, I feel what I say in my heart. I don't feel as though that this hour, my brothers and sisters, is just merely for stories or entertainment. Nor is it ritualistic for me or for you, my brothers and sisters, to be here and listen. I want to make clear, my brothers and sisters, that when I speak to you, it's not out of aggression. It's about the passion that I have in my heart personally and the passion that you have in your hearts as well, inshallah, for what is being said, for this message, and for what this message means to us in this day and age, in this mosque here in the West. I go by... Personally, I like to go by the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says these words. And they're very important. Take them with you. You want to take anything from Ashura or this lecture here? Take these words with you. The hadith says this. The person who wakes up and does not have, does not have any attention, does not have any care for what the Muslims are going through, for the state of the Muslims, then that individual is not a Muslim. Islam itself tells us to be passionate. And on, on that, that note of being passionate, I read a riwayah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look what happened. It is said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting once with one of his companions. All of a sudden, his uncle Al-Abbas walks into the room. And Al-Abbas was extremely angry. Extremely angry. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him, Ya Abbas, why are you angry? What's angering you? So he said, when we wa walk past the people of Quraysh, al-Muhajireen, in the city, we see them smiling, we see them laughing, we see them talking with each other, and they're having a normal conversation with smiles on their faces. But when we walk past them and greet them, they frown all of a sudden. So that angers me, Ya Rasulullah. The riwayah says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa got so angry that his face became red and sweat came down from his forehead and made its way down his nose from how much he was angry, from the anger that he had in his heart for those words. And he said, the person or the individual that does not love my family, 
does not have iman in his heart. The point what I'm trying to say, my brothers and sisters, is this. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt that there was a message, there was an idea that he had in his mind. And that idea brought about a certain level of passion that in one instance or another was, trans was translated into anger. Was translated into anger. Meaning that the passion that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had in his heart was a flame that was lit. It was a flame that was lit that drove him and drove the Muslims behind him. So the point that I'm trying to say is when I speak loud and passionate and I sort of burst your ears out from how loud I am on the pulpit, I'm not talking out at you. I'm speaking out of passion for you and for this community and for myself as you guys are all my brothers and my sisters. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. On that note, on the note of passion, on the topic of passion, we go to Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam on the plains of Karbala, where he taught passion how to be passionate. And he taught us the meaning of emotions and how it feels, and how it feels, and what it means to have a message and want to convey that message to others. If we want to know Aba Abdullah al Hussein on the plains of Karbala, my brothers and sisters, and we want to analyze the words of Imam al Hussein on that day, there are so many instances, so many instances that you know, and so many instances that you can think of. But when I was sitting down and I said, which of these instances should I pick? A name came about in one in the Rawayat that I was reading, and the name of that individual was, was Sa'id ibn Abdullah. Sa'id ibn Abdullah was one of the companions of Abba Abdullah al Hussein on that day. The Rawaya says this. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was fighting from Fajr up until some hour of the day. Many of his companions were killed. Wallahu a'lam, none of his family members have yet to go on to the battlefield. But Abu Abdullah al Hussein sees his fate coming near until Sa'id ibn Abdullah looks at the sky and he sees the sun has passed its zenith, as in the sun has started to decline towards where it sets in the west. And so Abu Abdullah al Hussein turns, or so, sorry, Sa'id ibn Abdullah turns to Imam al Hussein and says to him, Ya Abu Abdullah, we're going to meet death. Why don't we pray one last salat together? And so Imam al Hussein alayhi salam looked at him and he said, Dakarta salat. Ja'alaka Allah min al musalleen. You mention prayer. May God make you from those that pray. Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam stood up. He called on the opposing army and said to them, Between us and you, there is still the Sharia. Between us and you, there's still Islam. Respect the fact that we want to get up and pray. Just stop for a sec, stop for a little bit, let us pray, and then we can go back, no issue. We can go back, but just stop for just that time. Go pray you yourselves and let us pray. It is said they exchanged some words, some very harsh words from the enemies. They did not let Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam pray in peace. Imam al Hussein, seeing that they're not going to let him pray, he asks his companions to stand in front of him and those that are praying with him and defend them as they pray. So the Ruwaya says, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam stands up with who was left from his companions and family members. And they begin to pray Salat al-Khawf. They start to pray Salat. And the two in front of Aba Abdullah al Hussein or the other companions that were standing in front of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, the Rawaya says that when they see, when they used to see the arrow coming towards Imam al Hussein, instead of ducking, they would put their chests in front of the arrow and let the arrow hit them. They would block Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with their own chests. One Rawaya says, a man falls in front of Abu Abdullah Hussein and the Imam finishes his salat. And in his chest were more than 10 arrows, I believe the Rawaya says. He moved in front of 10 arrows to protect Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam as he prayed. My brothers and sisters, the topic that I want to speak about today is a topic that for many is something that is repetitive. Something we always speak about, salat, 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 salat. 
as in if you wanted to give another name for our religion or if you wanted to sort of summarize how about that our religion in one action it would be salat prayer but the fact of the matter is my brothers and sisters you find in today's world especially with the youth a either salat itself is not given its importance it's not given its value or b you find a lot of shabab are losing touch with their salat or shabbat losing touch with their prayer leaving salat altogether not praying they don't have that connection anymore so we're going to pose a question today let's pose this question why is this happening why is it that it's happening because i see it i see it from people that come from religious families and non-religious families alike rather i see it sometimes from people that come to the majalis and people that don't come to the majalis as in somebody that doesn't have some sort of religious backing something to sort of pull them towards some sort of worship that they do or connection to the religion i would understand but the problem is the issue is the challenge is this is something this is a phenomena that's happening with the religious individual and the non-religious individual somebody that has a religious background someone that does not have a religious background and on top of that on top of that those who do pray those who do pray they come and they say and i have this i had this so many times well i don't have motivation to pray i don't have that desire to pray i don't have the inner burning to pray inside of me something taking me towards salat if i do it it's a ritual if i do it it's just something that i do there's no passion behind it there's no meaning there's no desire there's no flame anymore it's gone but i just do it out of fear i do it because my parents want me to i do it because i just grew that way so tonight my brothers and sisters we want to analyze this we want to ask why why is this happening and inshallah we want to get out from this list or leave this lecture understanding where we stand that's where i stand why is it that i'm not praying if i'm not praying and if i am praying why is it i don't feel the desire in my heart and hopefully leave with that desire with that flame lit again so we ask the question why why is it that so many people are leaving salat not praying their prayers, their daily prayers, or not feeling that desire on the inside to pray. The first reason, my brothers and sisters, is ideological in nature, in a sense. Many people, many of us don't know why we pray. And yani, if I was to come and I say, brothers and sisters, and Taban, don't raise your hand if you know, that's not what I'm saying, but it's a rhetorical question. How much of us here and Ahmad Baz is included in this. How much of us know why we actually pray? Why we actually worship? What's the reason behind it? As in, forget the fact that our parents taught us to pray. When I was young, my dad taught me to pray. But if right now, when I have the ability to think for myself, and I have the ability to separate myself from my subjective method of thinking, and just think objectively, non-biasedly, why do I pray? What's the reason for it? It's a question to ask ourselves. When we go to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, they come and they give us the exact reason why we should pray. And they come and they say that an individual will reach different levels of worship, of ibadah, of insight, of spirituality, where they may pray for different reasons. But primarily, primarily, the reason that me and you, my brothers and sisters, pray is summed up in the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam where he says this and, as, and if anybody does come to the youth club during the normal you know, days of the Saturdays that we have here they probably have heard this riwayah a hundred times on the pulpit but whenever I can I say it because of the meaning behind it Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says there are people that pray there are people that pray out of fear of punishment and those individuals are the slaves why because they fear a punishment and so just so that the master does not punish them they pray just like the slave just so they don't get whipped and punished they do whatever it is that the master wants them to do that is the prayer of the slave 
And then there are people that pray because they want the reward. And that is the prayer of the businessman or the businesswoman. Oh God, I will give you prayer. Give me in return reward. This is the second level. And then there are people who pray and worship out of thanks. And that, and that is the prayer of the free man or woman. And that is the prayer of the free. My brothers and sisters, whenever you ask yourselves and whenever I ask myself, why do I pray? Why do I stand in the middle of the day? I leave my work, I leave my school, I leave everything. And I stand up on a prayer mat, face some wall, face some direction, wherever it is, and put my hands to my sides and say, Allahu Akbar, why? My brothers and sisters know that what you have today from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unmirrored, unseen, unparalleled from what others have today or had in the past. The blessings that you have, my brothers and sisters, is enough to make you and me stand up on that prayer mat, not just five times a day, rather the entire day, the entire day of worship would not be enough to give back what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam says these words. He says that I can't give you enough, ya Allah. Why? Because every single time I tell you thank you for what you have given me, I need to thank you for giving me the ability to thank you. And by thanking you then, I have to then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me the ability to thank Him once again. It's a never-ending chain. Comparatively, let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, what you have and what we have. Let me talk, tell, talk to you in terms of comparison. Because us as human beings, we understand things in relative, sort of in relative ways. There was a alim that was sitting on the pulpit once and I was watching him with my own eyes. He said once, me and my friend, Sayyid Fulan, we went to Iraq and we were on a mission. What was the mission? We had some money, we had some fundraising ideas and we wanted to find people in Iraq to sort of give them the money or have them be sort of the target of the fundraiser. Call it what you will. It is said we went, he says, we went to a certain village in Iraq on the outskirts of that village. And he said what we saw there, what we saw there in that place would make any human being just stand and cry. But he said we kept ourselves together. People were living in huts, little children on the streets, orphans, no one was taking care of them, children with no fathers, no mothers, no food, no adequate drinking water, no electricity, nothing, nothing. He said as we were walking, look what he said, as we were walking, we saw this little girl come up to us. And so we looked at her and we saw she was wearing regular clothes, she had no shoes on. It was normal, or it was, sorry, it was obvious that she was an orphan. Huh? So he says, I bent down and I said, Habibti, what's your name? You know what she said? She said, my name is Damma. Tear. Tear. He said, right when she said the name Damma, Tear, I did not see except tears flowing down my face and on my friend's face. You have so much, my brothers and sisters. When you stand up on that prayer mat, tell yourselves, let me tell myself, let me start to number the things that I have that others may not have around the world. Let me start to count my blessings in Allah Ta'ala. In the Quran, He says, count the blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And in another place, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تَحْصُوا if you count the blessings of God that you have in your life, you will never, ever, ever be able to quantify it. Think of that, my brothers and sisters. And that's why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says these words. Listen to what he says. He says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create heaven, imagine this, imagine a world where God did not create heaven. And God did not create hell. Imagine that world and imagine who you would be and I would be in that world right now. Think of that. It would have been obligatory and mandatory on human beings to worship God and obey God. Why? Out of thanks for what He has given them. Out of thanks for what He has given them, my brothers and sisters. The reason why we worship 
is to be free. And the way that we become free is by worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of thanks for what He has given us. So right now, my brothers and sisters, make it a goal when you go home, before you sleep, before you sleep, sit and think of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you. Just think of them and name five of them. And then imagine your life and let me, imagine my life without those blessings. Imagine your life without your mom, without your dad, without a house, without running water. How would you live? And let that drive you towards thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what the funny thing is with all of this that's being said, with all of the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these words. With these words, He says these words. وَقَلِيلْ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ In little amount, the minority of the people that serve me, my servants, small amount of them are those who thank. And inshallah, you will be. One of them. Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Put that goal in front of you, my brothers and sisters. To thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has given you. The second reason, my brothers and sisters, why people feel as though they have no motivation to pray is because the heart itself does not desire the salat. As in, we say, the heart itself has times where it feels close and has times where it feels far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the spiritual realm altogether. The heart itself, my brothers and sisters, has that tendency to feel close and wanting to pray, wanting to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes it doesn't want it. The problem is, is when you cannot or I cannot get the heart out of that last state of not wanting to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason for that, my brothers and sisters, a lot of the times is this one thing here. What is it? Is that the heart itself is not pure. Please listen to this. Please listen to this. Because this is very important. The heart itself is not pure. But we all know by default, we are all born with pure hearts. Each and every one of you. Each and every one of you was born with a clean slate, with a pure heart. How does the heart lose its purity? With none other than the sin, ahsant. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, or Imam al-Sadiq, one of the imams, he says, when a person commits a sin, a black dot appears on their heart. Now take this metaphorically or literally, no issue, but think of it. A black dot, a black dot appears on their heart. If they repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erases that black dot. But if they keep sinning and doing the same exact sin and adding to that, that black dot grows and grows and grows and grows and until it encompasses the entire heart. And at that point in time, the individual is not able to receive the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it comes to him or her. They are not able to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the time is there to connect to Him. They're not able to do so. The heart, my brothers and sisters, needs to be purified. And the way that it's purified is istighfar. Istighfar. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And when should I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness? Please, Shabab, please listen. And when does a person ask for forgiveness? When they actually feel that they have sinned. And to come to terms with that, my brothers and sisters, is the hardest thing a person can do. To come to terms with the fact that Ahmed has sinned. I have done something wrong. Because what we tend to do is make excuses to make ourselves feel good. But that itself is the meaning, the real meaning of regression. Progress comes when we are honest with ourselves. And we judge ourselves, my brothers and sisters. The purification of the heart, number one. Number two, hearing a hadith, hearing the stories of our ulama that would drive a person to pray. And here I have, I have one story that happened with one of our ulama. If anybody wants the reference, I can give it to you. Listen to this story. If you want motivation to pray, you want motivation to wake up and pray, to get up and pray, listen to this story. They said one of the ulama of Iran, one of the scholars of Iran, was captured by Saddam in Iraq. 
It is said that it was nighttime, and as you know, Saddam, he was a psychopath. He wasn't able to sleep if he did not see blood. This was Saddam. So it is said they were in the jail of Saddam, and they were being tortured. He says there were two men with us that they captured. Two men with us that they captured. They were hung by their feet from the ceiling. And listen what happened. He says they tortured them and tortured them and tortured them until they ripped their eyes out of their sockets. This is his words. He let them go. They had cuts on their bodies and those men were now blind. They said, he says they left us. We were on the sand in the jail cell. They left us and they walked out of the room. It was nighttime. He says, we all fell asleep with our cuts on the sand. Our cuts on the sand. He fell asleep and we all fell asleep. You know what he says? He says, watch what he says. He says, we got up for Fajr prayer. We didn't have water, so we did tayammum. Listen, please listen. You want motivation to pray? Look what he did. He got up for prayer. He did not have water, so he did tayammum. And then they prayed. They prayed with all the blood on their body and the sand. They prayed. Then he says, we looked at the sky and we doubted whether Salat al-Fajr was actually, it was actually time for Salat al-Fajr when we prayed it. So we ended up praying again. This man prayed Salat al-Fajr twice. In what state? Was he in his bed? No. He was covered with blood. He had no water. And in his wounds there was sand. This alim. It is said after Sukut Saddam, he was able to go back to Iran. Just think of that, my brothers and sisters. Now compare him and what I have. I have that warm bed. I have a good night's sleep. I have tomorrow something I'm looking forward to. Something I'm looking forward to. But I struggle not lifting myself off the ground that I slept on. Lifting that very, very, very light blanket off myself in the morning. Or standing up in the middle of the day, leaving whatever it is that I have to do and stand and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you need motivation, my brothers and sisters, think of that alim. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us these examples, gives me these examples. So I can feel as though I'm connecting to someone on my wavelength. That's why the ulama, they say, read the stories of the scholars before you. Because they're just like you. They're just like you. No different. And they're just like me. And we're all the same. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. The third reason, my brothers and sisters, that people, individuals, don't feel inclined to prayer is that they don't know the value of the salat. We said first, some don't feel as though they know why would they pray. Second, they don't have the motivation, the desire to pray. And third, they don't, some people don't know the value. I don't know the value of the salat itself that I'm praying. That itself, my brothers and sisters, that itself is an issue. Forgetting the other two, when we don't know the value of the Salat itself and the meaning of the Salat itself. But if I was to give you a hadith, if I was to give you a hadith about the value of Salat, then hear this hadith. Hear this hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, the actions of the people, the good of the people will be put will be put in their book. The book will be opened. And the first thing that will be looked at is the Salat. If it is accepted, then everything else in the book will be looked through. If it was not accepted, then everything else in the book has no meaning in the eyes of God. In qubilat, qubila ma siwaha. Wa in ruddat, rudda ma siwaha as in it equates to every good that a person could possibly do in their lifetime. The Salat itself. Now here's a question a lot of people pose. Here's a question a lot of people pose. I pray, every single day I, and I pray. 
I don't feel like it has an effect on me. I don't feel its effect. That's a great question. Why don't I feel like my salat has an effect on me? Why don't I feel like it has an effect on me? The answer is, my brothers and sisters, what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say in the hadith? He says, in qubilat, qubila ma siwaha. Wa in ruddat, rudda ma siwaha. What qubilat mean? Qubilat means accepted. If it is accepted, then everything else is accepted. If it's not accepted, then everything else is not accepted. There's a difference, my brothers and sisters, between completing the salat and having the salat accepted. They're two totally separate things. A person can complete the salat, as in they say, Allahu Akbar, and at the very end they do taslim. Khalas, they completed the salat. Rufi'at taklif, as we say. The obligation is not on the person's shoulders, as in they did not commit sin. They didn't commit a sin. That's it. But was the salat accepted or not? That's a huge question. So how do you know if the salat is accepted? How do I know if the salat is accepted? How do I know if the salat is accepted? Two ways. Number one. Number one. Am I focused in my salat? Am I there? Am I with it? The riwayat say, the riwayat say, the salat is only accepted in accordance to how much focus there is in the salat. I'm speaking to you right now. Imagine I'm speaking to you and I'm not focused on you. How much meaning does that conversation have? Imagine you're talking to me and I'm on my cell phone. How much meaning does that conversation have? Would you not feel offended? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepts the salat in accordance to how much focus there is in the salat. And so you ask me, how does someone focus on their salat? How do you get to a point where you're focused on what you're saying? Or what I'm saying? Number one, let's learn the meaning of what we're actually saying. Some of us don't understand what we're saying. Let's learn the meaning of it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you think of the mercy of God, think of your sins, my sins. Let me put my sins in front of me and say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the merciful, the beneficent. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki yawm al-Deen. I'm praising the Malik, the King, the one who has the full ability to benefit me and harm me, the one who has given me everything that I have, the one who has blessed me with everything that I own, the one who will I go back to on that day and stand in front of him. And everyone will watch as he judges me for what I have done. Maliki yawm al-Deen. Iyyaka na'bud. It's only you that we worship. And it's only through you that we find help and guidance. Brothers and sisters, the meanings are so deep. So deep. Let's think of those meanings when we're praying. Number one, not, being, not focusing. Number two, listen. Number two, there are certain actions, certain things that we are doing that do not allow our salat to be accepted. And they are three, possibly more, but three. Listen to the three. The first one, the first one in the rawayat, عقوق الوالدين. عقوق الوالدين. Not being good to our parents. Standing up to our parents. Hurting our parents. And then listen to this rawayat. Look at this rawayat. I'm not speaking for myself, I'm speaking the rawayat. Look what, look what the rawayat says. From Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. I'm going to read it in Arabic for the barakah, then we'll translate. Look what he says. عن الإمام الصادق من نظر إلى أبويه نظر ماقت وهما ظالمان له لم يقبل الله له صلاة لم يقبل الله له صلاة If a person looks at their parents, look at this. If a person looks at their parents, a hateful look. And even if they themselves were oppressive to him or her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept the salat for them. And imagine it's this situation. Well, ayyad billah, all of your parents are great people. I know many of them. Imagine your parents are not good people. We're not good to you. They're oppressive to you. They hurt you for no reason. And 
my, my parents, for example, and I look at my mother or my father, a hateful look, I frown in their face. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept the salat from me for that hateful look. They're oppressive, oppressive to this individual. They hurt this person for no reason whatsoever. That hateful look in that state will not allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept or does, will not allow the salat to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine in many of our situations where we have great families. We come from blessed families, mothers and fathers that are loving. Especially for the brothers, we stand up to our mothers and we say hurtful things to them. And even though some of the sisters as well, no problem. But I hear this mostly on the brother's side. We stand up to our mothers and we say hurtful things to them. Lam yaqbalillah salat. This is extremely important. Shabab, please. Extremely important. Lam yaqbalillah salat. Watch out. Watch out how we speak to our parents. Wallah al -azim. You one day will be a parent. The same way you spoke to your parents, the same way I spoke to my parents, my kids will speak to me. Same exact way, and this is in the riwayat. The same way I spoke to my mom, my kids will speak to my wife and me. Let me leave you with this. Let me leave you with this. Said there was a young man, your age, your age, here. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu he was dying on his deathbed. As he was dying, Rasul Sallallahu was called to sit in front of him, to sit beside him. Who was it? Ashraf Khalqillah, the most blessed, the highest, the one with the most merit, the most blessed creation, the best of creations of God was called to sit beside this man as he died, as he dies. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sits in front of him. And he sees that there's a woman that's also sitting on the other side, an older woman. The man starts to take his last breaths. His soul is coming out of his body. And as you know, when the soul is coming out of the body, it's between the material world and the spiritual world. It's starting to transition between the two. And so the eyes see what others do not see. The eyes see what others do not see. So listen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, what do you see? He says, I see a dark, disgusting, scary man coming towards me. And he's coming to take my soul. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows this man's a mu'min. He prayed, he fasted. He fasted. He did the good. He did what he had to do. This shouldn't be happening. This man did something in his life. He turns, he says, who are you? Turning to the woman. She said, I'm his mother. He looked at her and he said, and are you satisfied? Are you happy with your son? She said to him, no. This is the first time I see him in six years. Six years I haven't seen my son. This is the last time I'm going to see him and I'm still not happy with him. What did he do to his mother? What did he say to his mother? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to her, be satisfied with him. Be satisfied with him. Forgive him for what he's done. This is your son, huh? He's dying. Forgive him. And so she forgives her. Rasulullah looks at him and he says, what do you see? He says, the man is gone. The man is gone. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa prays for the man for forgiveness. And then asks him, now what do you see? He says, I see a beautiful man in white coming towards me, coming to take my soul. Where was this man going? And when his mother just spoke, where is he going now? Think of the moment in time, Shabab, please listen. Think of what was happening there. In one instance, in one instance, your mother can change your life. My mother can change my life in one instance. Know the value of your parents, my brothers and sisters. Number one. Number two, the Rawaya says, Shurbul Khamr, drinking wine, alcohol. And here's the Rawaya. An Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man sharib al-khamr, 
لم تحسب صلاته أربعين صباحا The person who drinks wine, drinks alcohol, their salat for 40 days do not count. It's wajib upon them to pray, but it doesn't count, not accepted. Keep that in mind. How many sabah? How many in the mornings? 40. The third one, ghibah. What do you say? Ghibah. And then listen to the rawaya. What did we say for khamr? How much? 40 mornings. Look for ghibah. An an nabi, man ightaba musliman aw muslimah. The person who does ghibah for their Muslim brother or sister. لم يقبل الله تعالى صلاته. How much? ولا صيامه. Their salat and their psalm. أربعين يوما وليلة. The person who does ghibah against his fellow sister or brother, please listen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept their fast nor their salat for 40 mornings and nights. Except إلا أن يغفر له صاحبه. Except or صاحبه. Except that the person that they were speaking against forgives them. Is it the forgiveness of God that we're after here? Forgiveness of the person that we spoke about. Ahmed spoke about me. لم يقبل الله له صلاة أربعين يوما وليلة. Those three. My brothers and sisters, sometimes the problem is with me. I'm the issue. I'm the issue. I'm causing my own destruction. I'm causing my own destruction. Whether it's by hurting my parents, by drinking alcohol, whatever we do on Saturday night or Friday night, whatever it is nowadays. Wednesday night, hatta badishma. And ghiba. Ghiba. What did he say for khamar? 40 sabah, 40 mornings. What did he say for ghiba? 40 mornings and nights, salat and siyam, until the person forgives. Allahu Akbar. Just the tongue. Letting the tongue go. Letting the tongue go, my brothers and sisters. Naam. Naam, my brothers and sisters. The value of salat was manifested on that day in Karbala, where Abba Abdullah Hussein stood in front of the armies and said, I am fighting you for this religion, and this entire religion is manifested in Salat by me turning away from Salat in my final moments. I'm turning away from my religion, my brothers and sisters. Imagine Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Hala, you, just imagine, let your imagination go. On the plains of Karbala, Shabab, on the plains of Karbala. Standing up in prayer, reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. He finishes the third ayah, and he sees his fellow brother receive an arrow in the chest. Finishes Surah Al-Fatiha. His other brother rece receives an arrow in his left shoulder. Goes into Ruku' and hears his brother moan from the pain. An arrow hit him in his stomach. And continues his Salat that way until he's up in Qunut. If you were Abu Abdullah al Hussein, or you were watching him pray, what do you think he would be praying for at that moment? What's there left to pray for, you'd say? I don't know what he prayed for. I don't know. But I'm sure, I'm sure Abu Abdullah al Hussein salam mentioned his Shia, you. Mentioned those that are not around him, but that will come and revive his name. Because that was his final salat. There was no maghrib for Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He was killed before maghrib. But I think he mentioned someone else. Someone that was not with him on that day. Not you. Not those who came before you. Not those who's going to come after you. A little girl by the name of Fatima Al-Alila. Who's not with Abu Abdullah al Hussein on that day. If you had your final qunut and you had children, you had family. I think you'd mention them in your qunut. Oh Allah. Oh Allah. Safeguard my child. Keep my child safe. I'm sure that Abu Abdullah al Hussein was thinking of Fatima al Alila. And who's Fatima al Alila? Fatima al Alila was the young daughter of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, who was too sick to go with them, too sick to leave Medina. And so Abu Abdullah al Hussein left her with Umm Salama. She was left in Medina. In the same way that Abu Abdullah al Hussein was in Qunut, Wallahu al Alim could have been thinking about Fatima al Alila, or in Karbala, thinking of his daughter. 
Fatima al-Alila was also thinking of Aba Abdullah al Hussein every single day, hoping that he would return. Little that she knew, she was hoping for something that would never come. She was praying for something that would never be. For Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam was killed, slaughtered. Naam. The Rawaya says Aba Abdullah al Hussein got his family ready. Imam al Hussein got now the family ready. Now we're ready to leave towards Karbala. Huh? Imam al Hussein gets his family ready, as we said yesterday, the day before. And he's about to leave. Until he hears a sound behind him. He's walking away, he's leaving. Khalas. Here's a side be- sound behind him. Abaya Hussein. Abaya Hussein. Ya Ahli. Intadruni. Oh, family. Wait for me, wait for me. The Imam turned around, only to see his young daughter Fatima calling from behind him. Imam Al Hussein orders Al Abbas to stop the caravan. He said to her, Bunaya Fatima. Bunaya Fatima, daughter of Fatima, did I not tell you to stay in the house? And so she said, Bella, ya abata, well, I can kneel at Mara, he took the honey at a minute. Of Lamented Dunia Fi, I need Fala to trick me. Yes, Father, but when I felt your absence in the house, the world darkened in my eyes. Don't leave me by myself in the house. He sent to her daughter, if I get a place I intend to stay in, I will send your uncle Abu Fadl al Abbas or your brother Ali al Akbar, and they'll bring you back to us. And so she says to him, Father, Father, my my soul is telling me that I'll never meet you after today. I'll never see you after this day, Ya Aba Abdullah. At least leave my brother Abdullah with me. It's as if she knows what will happen to him on that day. It's as if she knows he'll be slaughtered like the bird with an arrow. It's as if she knows he will die thirsty. It's as if she knows he will die and she'll never see him again. It said she kept waiting for her father until Bishr ibn Hadlab entered Medina. Look how she found out about her father's death. Bishr ibn Hadlam enters Medina. Months after Imam al Hussein leaves the city, he enters Medina, goes to the center of the city, and screams, Ya Ahla Yathribana, Amukam alakum biha, Qutil al Hussein, Fadmuim. الجسم منه مضرج بكربلا والرأس منه على القناة يدار يدار Oh people of Yathrib there's no reason for you to stay here Hussein has been killed so let the tears flow for his killing his body lies in Karbala covered with blood and his head is carried on the spear from country to country from city to city imagine hearing that your father has died after waiting months and months for him imagine hearing that he was killed thirsty imagine hearing that his head was cut off imagine hearing that your baby brother was slaughtered this was one daughter of Abba Abdullah but there was another daughter of Abba Abdullah that did not survive until she entered Entered Medina, and her name was Ruqayya alayhi salam. Some riwayat say that Ruqayya was only five years old, huh? 
After the death of Imam Al-Hussein, the enemies took the family to Damascus. On the way, this young girl was constantly asking for her father, Imam Al-Hussein. When they were in prison in the ruins of Damascus, near the castle of Yazid, she saw her father in a dream as she was sleeping. How did she see him? He was not hurt. He was not bloody. His head was still on his body. She had her head in his lap. He was smiling at her and wiping her head. Suddenly, Ruqayya wakes up only to find herself in the ruins, a captive sleeping on the cold ground. When she realizes this, this she screams Aina Abi Aturi bi Abi Al An Kadra Aito Al An Kana Mai Where is my father? Give me my father. I just saw him now. He was just with me. He was with me here. She woke the woman and the children. When they heard her voice, they started crying with her. Yazid from the castle wakes up for the crying of the women. And he says these words. This is what this man says. What are, these, what are noises these noises that have deprived, that have deprived me from my from sweet my sleep? sleep? They replied, they one of the daughters of Hussein is asking for her father. father. And so he and says, so he to, says them, to them, Wailakum, Khudu laha ra's abiha, Lita tasalla be. Wa want to you take her father's head so that she can feel comfort. He wants her father, we're going to give her her father's head. The servant came down and the head was a, well, the head was in a bowl. The bowl was covered with a cloth. When Ruqayya saw the bowl, look what she said. She turned to her aunt saying, Amma, Amma, ana la uridu ta'a. من ولا شرابة بل أريد أبي العزين عزير العزين Aunt Zainab, I don't want any food I don't want water I want my father Hussein The man uncovered the tray She saw the head of Abba Abdullah Hussein It was bloody There was blood on the beard of Abba Abdullah And his lips were still dry He didn't drink any water They were still dry She threw herself on the Imam's head and kissed it in the Abba ya Abba Abba ya Abba Man illadhi qata'a waridah Abba ya Abba Man illadhi qadabaka bidimai Abba ya Abba Man illadhi yaitamini Ala asghar sinni Father who was the one who cut your throat Father, who was the one who dyed your beard? Father, who was the one who made me an orphan? She kept on crying and crying until she became silent. Imam al-Sajjad sees this and says to his aunt, عمر فعيها رفعيها فإنها قد مات Aunt, raise her off my father's head. Why? For she has died. She has passed away. Ya Sayyidah. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين يا الله we ask you, Ya Allah, by Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, accept this majlis from us, Ya Allah. Accept our deeds, Ya Allah. Accept our salat, Ya Allah. Embed in our hearts the love of salat and worship, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, make us from those who follow the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Make us from those who love Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Make Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad happy with us and satisfied with us, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Make our parents satisfied with us and happy with us, Ya Allah. All of us together for Sahib al-Zaman, one voice, one voice. And they say, when the tear is on the cheek, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the dua. So all of us, one voice. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن و
وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه Everyone together. في هذه الساعة وفي كل وليا وحافظا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين Let's read Surah Al-Fatiha for the believers and the Specifically, the Haj Abu Aqil, the Haj Abu Wissam, the Haj Yasir Bazzi. And also to cure the Shab Ilal Hamoud Ibn Imtiyaz, let's read Surah Al-Fatiha for them. And for any person, that any of your family members that have passed away and anybody that you know that is in dire need of dua, let's read Surah Al-Fatiha for them with a loud salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.